All right. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Michelle Stewart. Um, I'm a faculty member at the University of Regina. Um, I used to be the director of the Community Research Unit, um, which has now become the Community Engagement Research Center. And uh, today we're coming together um, through a partnership between the University of Regina and the City of Regina um, to focus on um, supporting initiatives that bring together um, predominantly uh, the nonprofit sector or frontline human service agencies and the University of Regina as it relates to uh, research projects as well as evaluation. And so the session that you're attending today um, has been called um, Impact Through Collaboration, How Evidence-Based Research and Evaluation Can Better Support the Nonprofit Sector. And so welcome everyone today and thank you for taking time out of your very busy days. Very fortunate to be gathering here on Treaty 4 territory where the University of Regina and the City of Regina are located. Um, and as folks know, um, the University of Regina also has a presence in Treaty 6 territories. Today, what we're hoping to do is facilitate a conversation um, that will allow for um, the audience to get a sense of how some of these collaborations um, can come together, um, the strengths of collaborating, um, some of the challenges around collaboration, with the overall goal of facilitating increased um, collaboration between uh, university researchers and evaluators and the community partners that do the frontline work um, in, our, in our community. And so we're really fortunate today that we have um, an awesome uh, group of panelists that are joining us. So in a moment, I'm going to be turning things over to the panelists, but just so that we have a sense of uh, who's joining us, we have, um, we have Ann Perry and Lori Clune um, who are joining today to talk about a project on hidden homelessness. We also have Jack Brasser and Claire Carter who will be discussing um, a project that's focused on supporting uh, 2S LGBTQI um, folks as it relates to mental health in the city um, with a focus on Regina. Andrea Kotler Livingston will be speaking about a project um, that we, um, I work with, uh, with Andrea, um, which is the Integrated Justice Program. And then Tracy Sandin um, will be speaking um, about a project that they are involved with, um, which is accessing healthy foods in Regina. Um, and uh, Julia Seamer isn't joining us today, but that's a project that they do collaboratively. So what we're gonna do is have um, the panelists introduce themselves as they do a short summary of their project. So they're just gonna be opening up right now, maybe about um, eight or so minutes, just talking generally about their projects that they have. Um, and then we're gonna turn over to a round table um, after that. But effectively, we've asked the panelists in this first um, round to describe their research relationship with the agency um, and how did it come to be or what kind of research questions or activities have been co-created. And so I'm gonna turn things over now to the panelists. They've been asked to speak for about eight minutes. I've politely noted that I'll nudge them at nine minutes and I will most definitely let them know my alarm has gone off at 10 minutes. Um, but it's really helpful to give everyone sort of an overview of what the projects are um, and then we're going to go into um, a conversation after that. We've got some roundtable questions that I've generated and we've also reserved some time for the audience to potentially pose some questions as well. So if you have questions, if you can hold on to them right now, specific questions about the projects um, as well as more broad scale questions about collaboration. So in, um, in the order that I, I have randomly assigned. Um, I'm going to see if uh, Tracy Sandin can kick us off. Sure. Good morning. Um, I work with the Saskatchewan Health Authority here in Regina with Health Promotion and I'm here um, representing Food Regina. So Food Regina is a network of local organizations that are working together to improve the local food system. Um, so our members work together uh, to improve community food security by supporting research, public awareness, education, infrastructure and policies related to the local food system. So our project is looking at updating a report that our department partnered with a few other organizations with in 2012. So it was um, mapping where you could find healthy and unhealthy food across the city. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, over seven years when this report was first published, uh, the city's food climate and the city's landscape has changed quite substantially. You're seeing a lot more um, specialty food stores uh, opening up other larger centers uh, closing or opening up in different areas of the city. Um, there's also new data available. The food bank has a heat map. We also have a food asset map. Um, so the technology has also changed. So we can now digitally overlay maps and there's greater fluidity for the visual representation and interpretation. Um, we felt this report was um, important to update because it could be used as policy and advocacy. 
Um, you could help identify the food deserts and the food swamps. So if you look at kind of some of the health research, um, people who live in food deserts are going to have more difficulty accessing healthy foods. And if you look at uh, food swamps, that's a high density of unhealthy foods uh, per ratio of, of people. Um, and when we look at health outcomes, we're seeing that people who live in food swamps have higher rates of chronic disease, obesity, and other challenges. Uh, the tool can also help identify strengths and gaps in healthy food accessibility. So when we're looking at planning programs or initiatives, we'll have a better assessment of where they're currently located and where maybe people may struggle accessing it. Uh, it can help coordination and planning, um, community engagement, and looking at organizational and citywide benefits. When we look at how we uh, partner with the university, um, it really provides an excellent opportunity for students to be involved and apply their GIS and cartographic skills in a real world setting. So we've teamed up with Dr. Seymour with the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at the University of Regina. And her specialty is really in GIS and geo visualization. Um, we have a senior undergraduate uh, in the Bachelor of um, GIS Science program and uh, other students to help us along in kind of the journey. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Seamer was teaching a class and unable to kind of join us um, today, but uh, she's definitely a huge kind of asset to uh, the program. Um, we want to definitely thank the uh, Community Engagement Unit um, and Research Center with the University of Regina and Lynn, who helped facilitate the connection for this project to happen. Um, because it definitely um, wouldn't have happened without somebody having the um, expertise and the access to the GIS kind of mapping tools and software. Thanks. Well, thank you. That was very concise. All right. I was like, when the first person out of the gate, like really like sets the bar. So that was like four and a half minutes, pretty sure. Um, it's very challenging. Thanks, Tracy. Um, and as we sort of move between the panelists, um, one thing I sort of think to myself is how, how does the university come into these partnerships? And so um, Tracy's worked with a number of different projects over the years, a um, number of different faculties at the U of R. Um, I was still the director when this project was funded and it was striking to me um, the application of GIS. Um, you know, it's, it's not that it hasn't been done before, but the application of GIS and this idea of giving students real world access, um, real time access to data and understanding of how their skills that they're learning can be applied. Um, and so a really interesting project. Um, okay, I'm going to switch gears. I won't editorialize too much. Um, I'm gonna switch over to uh, Lori and Anne. I'll give the floor to Anne first. Okay, good morning. Thanks, Lori. Um, so good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, I just our project um, is on uh, uncovering hidden homelessness. Um, I'm the executive director of Circle Project. Been here for uh, a number of years, and um, as a community-based organization, uh, we struggle with uh, research. We know how important it is, but we seldom have the resources to be able to. Uh, do the research ourselves. So these collaborative partnerships that we engage in um, are really important uh, to us and to the community. So uh, first off, I want to give a, a shout out to Lisa Workman. Uh, this, was, this was her idea as far as uh, an issue that she was really concerned about and saw a lot in her work in the community. And um, I know she reached out to Lynn and um, they were actually the ones that that uh, really got the ball rolling on this and expanded the team and uh, got us all together. So um, I want to give them both a nod uh, because their participation in this um, is really important. So um, homelessness, everybody knows that that's, uh, everyone's talking about homelessness now and uh, people are seeing um, the homeless and they're wanting to um, help and assist. Uh, the issue that we identified was that uh, those that are absolutely or chronically homeless are a very small portion, a small percentage of the actual uh, homeless population and what we were 
what we were most concerned with were those that are the hidden homeless, because um, that's a huge group of people. And we knew from the community perspective that that's occurring um, each and every day, each and every season. Um, but there was no research to back it up. There was no, there was nothing to validate that the things that we were seeing were actually documented somewhere. So that's where the important piece of the, the research came in. Why is this important? Um, this is important because if we are going to respond, um, and you notice that I use the word respond versus react, um, if we are going to respond to the needs in our community in a holistic way and in a very effective way, um, we need to use all the resources available to us, including research, so we actually know um, how widespread the issues are and we've got a really good handle on what actually is happening in the community. So this research uh, on hidden homelessness um, and not only just the research on the hidden homelessness, but the approach that we took um, was was very different. Um, our story as far as how we work together um, is a pretty interesting story uh, because of course we work right at the grassroots level in the community and um, you know, we went back and forth a little bit over the questionnaires and, and um, I think both learned a lot about um, you know, we learned a lot about working with researchers and the things that are necessary and the, and the things that we can negotiate on because for us, the issue always is um, if, if individuals are experiencing homelessness of any kind, whether it's absolute relative homeless or hidden homelessness, they are vulnerable. And we need to be very careful not to exploit vulnerable people or to traumatize them um, in the questions that we're asking. Um, so that was something that was first and foremost at the at the uh, top of our uh, priority list on you know how we're going to engage in the community. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I've missed anything. And Laurie, I think you can jump in. Yeah, so hi everybody, my name is Lori Kloon. Um, I'm a nurse with a background in a lot of different areas, um, but community nursing is one of my um, passions. And so I've worked with vulnerable people for a long time, um, or people who are considered vulnerable because they're not as vulnerable as what some people think they are. They're very resilient people. Um, but my background is, uh, I have a degree in sociology and I also in my graduate education, I was um, schooled a lot in uh, Palo Ferreira. So community action research kind of has come to me as, as a way of thinking and a way of doing um, things. Um, Anne's right about Lisa Lynn and actually I was involved with um, for a couple of years, we put in many applications to different places, the why and whatnot, to try and get um, to do work in hidden homelessness and homelessness in Regina. And it's um, because of our partnership with Anne that things have finally come to uh, fruition. And I've learned as well, as we go on today, I'll share so much that I've learned from Anne and um, how our partnership has really um, helped us to put together a strong project that I know is going to make a difference. So I guess I'll stop there. Anything else to add then, Anne? Sorry, I'm a bit slow on the uptake here. The, I had myself muted. Um, I, I think the only thing that I would want to add, um, you know, we've been involved in research, Circle Project has been involved in research primarily in um, family violence. That's one of the areas that, um, you know, affects um, a, a large number of Indigenous people. They're overrepresented, obviously, in, you know, 
family violence, hidden homelessness, homelessness. So, um, you know, our focus is always on the Indigenous community as an Indigenous organization. And I, so, so this research, each piece of research that we do when we enter into this collaboration, um, it's very distinct and individual and it, it has its own personality um, and that's a really good thing because um, it it actually helps to build the skill set in the community as well and build a better understanding in the community um, when we can come forward uh, to discuss an issue and we've got research back us up um, we have been far more successful in being able to uh, secure the resources needed to respond to the issues that are happening right here on our own community. So that would be the only other thing that I would add. Great, thanks very much. Well, I don't even need my timer. This is amazing. Look at me just turning off my timer. All right. Um, so, you know, in listening to um, Ann and Lori, um, I think something we're gonna see regularly um, is a recognition of how relationships are building up, right? And um, I think we're gonna regularly hear the role that Lynn has um, through uh, the Community Engagement Research Center that, um, you know, it's often about potentially having an idea in the community and someone that can help make those connections on campus. And so Lisa Workman, um, who a lot of folks know, um, tireless advocate in our community, um, you know, and Lynn were able to sort of take the beginnings of an idea, find the right kind of collaboration um, of partners that could potentially work on the project. And then, you know, we are fortunate that the Faculty of Arts um, does have a little bit of seed money for projects of this nature that can allow for these very unique collaborations to take place. I think that um, the other thing I would say is that the connections that can come from these types of projects, these smaller scale projects, um, are often able to scale up based on the findings. Um, we're going to talk later about the role of evidence-based research and evidence um, inside of designing a project as well as the role of evaluation and and this is not to say that this is specialized um, knowledge um, that's only held by researchers on campus but I think really the strength of a strong collaboration is trying to figure out what it looks like to do co-design and collaborate so that we're seeing mentorship um, I think as Lori said, like Lori learned from Anne, Anne and Lori have learned from Lisa and working together, they learn from one another. And to me, that's really like the chemistry you're looking for in a really strong collaboration is an understanding that everyone is in partnership um, very strongly. I'm gonna turn things over here in a moment to Jack and Claire to talk about their collaboration, but I think folks can probably see right now that there's a real strong focus of um, social justice within this panel. Um, and I think the the different ways that issues come together. Um, even though we see a specialization in what the funding base is, I think there's an expectation that we're thinking really broadly about the context in which individuals' lives um, are impacted by different forms of um, you know, systemic racism, barriers to access in, in care. Um, and so um, you know, when you're thinking about your own funding project, it's always really important to think about the particulars of the project that you're looking at, but then those broader contexts. And again, those partnerships really help us do that because we're thinking about the, the challenge in the community from multiple vantage points. I'll turn it over though to uh, Jack and Claire now. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, my name is Jack Brosser. Um, I go by they, them pronouns, and I'm the executive director of the UR Pride Center. Uh, when I'm not uh, working though, I'm working on my master's of education with a focus on curriculum. Um, and my background is in social work, so that's sort of the, um, the knowledge that I bring uh, to the nonprofit and community based work that I do. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, I'm originally from Treaty 11 territory, uh, which is the land of the Klicho uh, in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories. And I, I just want to recognize that that's sort of where a lot of, uh, a lot of my knowledge uh, was shaped by the people, uh, by Klicho people living in the Northwest Territories in Denende. Um, so our project, uh, as Michelle noted, uh, is about uh, evaluating mental health realities for 2SLGBTQ people in Regina. And this project really came about um, 
I, I am a person who, you know, as I'm sure other nonprofits on the call can, can attest to, just like the amount of, not, of grant writing that we do to try to find funding for the projects that we, that we know are important, often based on anecdotal evidence uh, or sort of uh, stories that we're hearing from the people that we serve. So um, in 2019, UR Pride received funding from the Community Initiatives Fund with the province to, uh, to pilot a mental health uh, counseling program, um, which was the first, uh, first of its kind in Regina that sort of focused, uh, meant to specifically provide LGBTQ um, focused and specialized counseling to LGBTQ people by an LGBTQ counselor. And when we were, when I was drafting this, um, this, this funding application, it was incredibly difficult to find research about LGBTQ mental health realities in Saskatchewan. Almost all of the LGBTQ mental health um, research it, that exists in Canada is mostly out of Toronto or Ontario, um, even some in Alberta. But when you look at Saskatchewan and Manitoba, um, so the sorry, the prairie provinces, there's only really one piece of, you know, one report or research um, report that speaks specifically to mental health for LGBTQ people in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, but it's even a smaller sort of subgroup of that of, of transgender youth in, in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So often when I would be drafting these funding applications, I would have to pull research from um, from sort of uh, scenarios or situations or places that weren't as relevant to Saskatchewan. And then I would have to sort of make some assumptions um, or just sort of hope that whoever my funder was sort of believed me um, and believed the, believed the competency and the, and the capacity of our organization to have, to have a strong understanding of, of, of the issues in our communities. So um, in realizing that, and I think especially because of our partnership with other LGBTQ organizations in the province like Out Saskatoon, as we're working together as, as nonprofit organizations to try to approach um, particularly provincial government to, to fund a project, we need evidence, like we need research. And so um, this was a project that we, a research project that we created out of a need for, to be able to, to, to rationalize um, our funding, off, like the, the request for funding that we were making, but also the best practices that we had come to understand. Um, and as our counseling project now has, has existed for a little over a year, uh, we've come to understand that having an LGBTQ counselor is really important, um, but we don't have like statistical data to back that up. So that's sort of how this project came to be. Um, and we're really lucky at UR Pride to be intimately connected to the university through our relationship as a student center um, on the University of Regina campus, although our program serve the entire city. Um, and so we already have really great relationships with different faculty members at the U of R who are LGBT identified or who do work with LGBTQ people. So it was really easy for us to make that connection. Um, but the, the really great thing about the Community Engagement and Research Center and sort of as we were working with Lynn was um, the sort of the willingness to help us shape our project uh, in a way that made sense, but also to be able to find, you know, we didn't need huge amounts of funding. Um, and often the funding that exists out there for, um, for research projects tend to either be a lot or you know two or three hundred dollars at a time so it was really really wonderful to be able to access um, the community engagement and research centers support in that way although we didn't necessarily rely on on sort of the relationship building um because we've we've worked with folks like claire uh, on a variety of different research projects over the past number of years so um i don't know claire if i'm missing anything or things that you want to speak to but um that's sort of a little bit about our project And uh, Claire, I think you covered it beautifully. I mean, I think the only thing I would say is that I, I just feel really grateful that we've had a relationship um, that has evolved in potentially a bit of a unique way. Like we obviously started out um, in terms of like you were doing courses with me and we had methodological conversations and research questions really early on. And it's been just so beneficial for me to have uh, that grounded context and that we have, um, yeah, really grown in those conversations over different projects. And um, that it's a really, um, it's really mutually grown in some really beautiful ways. And I just feel like this is something that to me is fundamental to the work that I hope to do, but also that I can see like your pride has just been phenomenal in the work that they're doing. So anyway, I, I just say it's, it's been a kind of a unique scenario, but I think it's one that uh, I think benefits both of us and, and has been very rich. I would like to hope so, yes. <laughs> awesome, thanks for that. Um, everyone's uh, 
keeping track of their time very well. Um, a couple of things to sort of pick up, um, and we'll talk about this more later. Um, but further to, to Jack's point, um, you know, where is the research or sometimes um, in the work that we do, community work that we do, um, nonprofit work that we do, human services work that we do, and for researchers as well, um, there can be an assumption <clears throat> that we know something is as it appears, right? Anecdotal evidence suggests like we know um, that there's a need for the type of work we're trying to do, but there doesn't necessarily um, present uh, research um, that you can use in grant applications. A lot of the granting agencies are looking for an evidence-based approach. Um, I think we are in the era of evidence-based approaches, um, evaluation embedded within projects, but the question is like, where's the capacity to do these things? Um, and what does it look like if you really don't find evidence directly related to the thing that you're trying to work on? Um, do we know that there's a hidden homelessness problem in Regina? We most definitely do, but we still have to collect the data on it to better understand it, as Ann and Lori are talking about. Do we know that we have food deserts and that has adverse um, impacts on social determinants of health for individuals? Of course, we know that is the case. People that live in Regina can tell you all the places where there used to be grocery stores and there are no more. But what does it mean to actually dig in and try to better understand it, especially from an interdisciplinary perspective? Um, which is what we're seeing um, with a lot of these projects. And going back to Jack's um, uh, you know, notes about where the evidence lies and the need for us to engage in best practices, but where do we find those best practices? And sometimes if the research is quite novel, you might be at the foreground of trying to imagine not only what the research is, but also how that research can inform the best practices that you're going to propose. And so these are some of the challenges that we have. And you know, as we're seeing here, um, Lynn plays a critical role through the Community um, Research Unit uh, slash Community Engagement Research Center in um, creating those kind of mid-sized grants. And I know that there's other micro grants that are available through the University of Regina and some of these partnerships that allow for that first part of research to happen. So more than a few hundred dollars, but not the gigantic grants. It can be quite daunting. Um, but as we can see here, a number of projects, even with smaller grants, are based on really solid, strong relationships. Um, you know, and then, of course, sometimes we're adding some people to the chemistry. All right, so I'm going to switch things over to Andrea. Um, Andrea uh, Cutler Livingston is from the FASD network. I'll throw it to you, Andrea, and you can talk about you can talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. Excellent. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, my name is Andrea Cotler Livingston, and I'm the executive director at the FASD Network of Saskatchewan. So FASD is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, for those of you who may not know that acronym. Um, we have worked with Michelle on, a, on Dr. Stewart on a few projects. Um, so this one that I'm going to talk about, though, is the Integrated Justice Program. And I think part of the reason that uh, Dr. Stewart brought us this project is is the way we operate in under a harm reduction model and we meet people where they're at. So we allow our clients to direct the, the kind of support that they receive. So um, a little bit about the project is we are looking at the over incarceration of Indigenous um, offenders in the criminal justice system. So we are looking kind of at the whole criminal justice system wherever they enter and or exit and we are supporting uh, victims as well as offenders which it makes for kind of an interesting um, different kind of support everybody in that accesses the project um, has some sort of complex cognitive intellectual disability, uh, including FASD. One of the strengths I believe in our support is that people don't need to receive a diagnosis in order to access support. They just need to suspect that they might have FASD, which presents in, in different ways. And we know that there's also um, overrepresentation of people who have uh, FASD in the criminal justice system as well. So our, our support workers, we have two in Regina and one in Saskatoon, and we also have peer navigators. And there's a, a handful of peer navigators. We started with five, and I believe we have three right now, who um, either have experience with FASD or experience in the criminal justice system or both. And they work alongside the support workers and to help identify people 
who might need to access support. So sometimes they're in the courts, um, sometimes they're accessing community services themselves. And, and that's a really neat aspect, I think, of the project in, in that um, they have sometimes accessed the same supports that they're, that they're bringing people to, which I think is, is really strong. Um, we are, another really interesting part of this, uh, where Michelle comes in is in the research part, in the evaluation part, I suppose it's not, we're not doing research, but we are doing evaluation on the project. So we're in at kind of the same position in that there's not a lot of um, good research about people with FASD in the criminal justice system. We do know that there is an overrepresentation, like I said, of people with FASD as well as indigenous um, people in in jail, incarcerated. So what we are trying to do is we support people in the community, we support people through court, um, through pro probations, through, you know, be release. And when they're released, we help them come up with a really good release plan, a really practical release plan, and help them access those things like the housing and the support that they need in order to be successful in the community. And I think that's where a lot of our really strong community partnerships come into play is that we don't ever want to be the only support for people. We really rely on the whole community to to be supportive. And we've had some really good successes so far with that. The program's been in operation for a year and it, it is a three-year project. Uh, another piece to the project is File Hills Coppell Tribal Council. So we have a really um, broad range, I guess, under the University of Regina uh, contract. So another uh, project within this project that we're going to be undertaking is um, the writing of GLADU submissions. So um, for those of you who don't know, GLADU factors are for um, Indigenous offenders and, it, and they can be and should be submitted anytime there's a potential loss of liberty. So um, the courts are supposed to be receiving these, so we are going to really try and, and start getting those back into the courts. We have workers who have now been certified in, in GLADU writing through railroads. So that's another really exciting part of the project that I think is going to make it unique in the kind of support we can provide for people and, um, and help them in their, in their journey of healing as well. So our support is also uh, a trauma-informed, uh, as we know, people who are in, incarcerated or in the criminal justice system are often have often faced trauma and um, indigenous the indigenous population has faced a lot of trauma as well so um, I think that's pretty much our project in a nutshell awesome great thanks Andrea I think um, you know I'm moderating the sessions today so I think I'll just add just briefly to the kind of elements that Andrea discussed is um, this project uh, through, is funded through Public Safety Canada as a flow through contribution agreement, which means that the University of Regina, um, I as a researcher, I'm the project lead, but the money comes through the University of Regina and is directed to frontline services, um, which was critically important to me um, when this funding line came open. Um, it's funding that is understood to be in uh, direct conversation with Truth and, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. And so this project really focuses directly on TRC call to action number 34, which is criminal justice reform as it relates to over incarceration of Indigenous peoples and those specifically with um, complex cognitive disabilities and trauma, as Andrea said. So the goal with this project over three years is, uh, is fundamentally to send um, almost all of the money out to frontline service um, providers who then employ um, frontline workers um, to intervene on what we know to be a social justice issue in Canada, um, which is the overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples. And then as Andrea indicated, the role of the researcher really comes in um, to engage on the evaluation piece, which does also speak to TRC called Action 34, because evaluation is embedded um, within TRC called Action 34. So through the Saskatchewan Population Health and Evaluation Research Unit, um, we engage in a co-design and collaboration as it relates to evaluating 
um, formatively um, how this project has been moving um, to help shape and reshape and better understand what elements of the project are working and maybe how some project elements could change to best support individuals and workers, um, which I think is critically important. Almost everyone on this call is either a researcher, evaluator, or someone that works in the nonprofit sector or delivers frontline services. And we know the critical importance of supporting workers um, to understand that the work that they do is important. Um, and so how do we support workers? How do we do better at, at the frontline? were some of the things that I was concerned with when I put the project forward to Public Safety Canada. Cool, thanks, Andrea. Thank you, I forgot to mention the, the TRC, so thank you for that, I had oh. that written down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, awesome. So we're going to switch gears here. Look at that and we're right on time with my with my little agenda that I made for myself. All right. Um, so I'm going to open it up for a roundtable. On this first roundtable question, I'm going to pose, I'm going to put it out to the agencies um, to answer first. And then I'll circle back if um, the researchers or evaluators want to add um, to the answer. But I'd like to pose to the to the agencies on the call. Um, so this would be to Anne and to um, Jack and to Andrea and to Tracy. What are the benefits of community-based research and evaluation from your perspective? So the question again, what are the benefits of community-based research and evaluation? And I'll open that up to agencies. Uh, maybe I'll start with Anne. Very good, thanks, Michelle. Um, so, for us, the uh, I guess the main benefit of the of the community based re research um, and evaluation is is the validation for the work um, that is being done in the community, um, and having that other set of eyes. Um, because in this sector, one of the things that I've seen certainly over the years, the, there there can be. Uh, because we're working directly in the front lines. So we are singly focused on the work that we are doing. And um, when we are engaged in research, one of the benefits is that you, that, that focus broadens um, and you start looking at the bigger picture which um, is an important reminder for all of us. There, you know, historically and uh, nonprofit, the nonprofit sector has been, you know, under-resourced and overworked. Um, and it's really difficult sometimes to be able to actually take the time to stop and take a look at the big picture and take a look at what, it, you know, are we engaged in evidence-based research? Are we, everything is about outcomes now, which is part of, of course, logic models and evaluation, which is really important because if, if you don't, for us, if you do not have a really good sense of what you're trying to accomplish, you're just doing busy work. So community research can help um, agencies like ours also really get a, 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 narrow, a, a narrow down focus on, okay, there's all these things to do. What are, we, what are we prioritizing on? And we can actually use that as part of our strategic planning. So, you know, here's the four main issues that came up over the next five years. These are the priorities in this order. Um, so that's, I think, one of the big benefits uh, for us anyway. Awesome. Thank you, Anne. Um, maybe I'll throw it over to Jack. Yeah, totally. Um, I think a lot of what Anne was talking about uh, is definitely sort of relevant to the work that that I do uh, within LGBT nonprofits. Uh, I think being able to, you know, Anne, Anne briefly talked about uh, sort of being able to like work things into your strategic plan as an organization and uh, and and allow sort of your priorities. Um, as, as an organization, you're going to have priorities, you're going to have things that you're focusing on. And, and when it comes to community based research, it really allows you to, um, I think so often when, when we have priorities uh, as, a, as a nonprofit leader, like that's a priority for my programming or that's a priority for my staff, but being able to make to, to have it be bigger and that it becomes now a research priority um, as well for a researcher in our community, I think can be really great. But for me, one of the biggest benefits of community-based uh, research and evaluation is the fact that, um, and we see this, I think, within, within any marginalized group, but I'm going to speak specifically to queer and trans people, is that too often the people doing research about queer and trans people are not people who identify that way themselves. Um, and we see that um, sort of through a feminist or queer 
um, research methodology lens and perspective, um, that's not always the best uh, choice, or at least it's not, uh, if it is the decision that's made, it needs to be purposeful. And so um, I see overwhelmingly, like I get, you know, almost weekly emails from people asking me to recruit participants for them um, as, a, as a nonprofit serving LGBTQ folks. Um, and being able to seek out researchers and seek out partnerships with researchers who have lived experience uh, in the things that we're studying um, is really, really helpful for us because it also, which sort of goes into my next point about, about a benefit of this type of work, um, is that uh, too often as queer people have, you know, when we look historically at when queer people first started being researched, queer people be, were being researched so we could put them in jail. Like that's sort of like where the history comes from. And so for me, always trying to be thoughtful about um, are our research participants being taken care of and are being, um, are being, you know, is there, is there a, a um, a safer or comfortable space for them as they're being researched? Um, are they being researched in ethical ways? And I think as a nonprofit provider and as a sort of like on the ground community based organization, the people that I'm researching are also the people that I'm serving. And so it becomes like an ethical uh, and moral obligation for me and the work that I'm doing to make sure that these participants are being taken care of because I know that I'm going to have to see them again. And I think that often um, sometimes uh, with researchers, um, and I've even found this in some of the research that I've tried to do or that I've tried to develop as part of my schooling, um, is we don't always think about participants as, as like, out, you know, although we should, uh, I think that it can be really easy for us to sort of, especially when we're doing uh, quantitative research, to just sort of see numbers rather than seeing like people. And I think that um, as a nonprofit provider, um, I have to do that. I have to see people as people um, and, and maintain that throughout, throughout the research. So I would say that those are sort of some of the biggest, uh, the biggest benefits, um, aside from the one that I mentioned prior to, which is just like being able to have research that specifically addresses like our funding applications, which helps us get funding, which helps us grow, et cetera. But yeah, those are the two that I can think of. Thanks, Jack. Uh, maybe I'll ask Tracy um, your thoughts. Sure. Um, for us, our specific project, um, we couldn't have done if we didn't have some sort of specialized expertise. We didn't have the knowledge, the skills, or the resources around the table to do GIS mapping. And I think having that um, concrete visualized data to something that we hear anecdotally regularly is really powerful. Um, and it's not, it's something we can't get through partnership. We have that shared learning where we build capacity in ourselves. Um, I think we build capacity in the partnerships and the people we kind of work with. Um, and I think it's just a win-win all the way around um, to be able to get knowledge that, that we couldn't have had otherwise if we didn't have the partnership. Great, thanks, Tracy. Um, Andrea, I'll also open it up for your feedback here. Okay, I think uh, one of the benefits definitely for us as an organization is the evaluation portion does give um, organization uh, an opportunity to really practically have an action item on the TRC. So we can actually take that item and um, operate our justice program and look at the over incarceration of indigenous um, indigenous people and get the evaluation process on that which is part of the the TRC um, I think also with evaluation um, we have run justice program uh, prior to our involvement with with dr. Stewart and um, having the evaluation portion and the university as part of it I think has really strengthened the program and it keeps us on track and it also will produce something that we can give to the funders to prove that uh, the, the program is doing what we say that it's doing so oftentimes we can give reports and give numbers but they want to know what kind of evaluation we've actually done so it does speak to the evidence-based piece that Michelle was talking about before. Great, thanks Andrea. I think um, I'm going to open it up for the researchers and evaluators to also offer their feedback. Something I would put into play too is, um, you know, as, um, as the project lead, for example, with the Integrated Justice Program, um, when our reporting times came in, 
Um, it also offered an opportunity to critically engage with the funders um, when, when we have funding in hand to critically engage with the questions around evaluation. Um, because for example, I'm not invested in a zero sum evaluation that says this project works or doesn't work. We're trying to figure out structurally what does and doesn't work within the project. And again, as I had said earlier, in this project, um, I'm very much invested in interventions in the justice system and in interventions that we're evaluating and in interventions that are evidence-based, but I'm also very invested in the staff feeling supported so that the staff are stable so that they can do the type of work we're asking them to do, which is very labor intensive work, um, emotionally intensive, um, and depending on your own background, the work is very challenging. And so we're trying to think about the complexities of evaluation um, through a fairly elaborate co-designed evaluation um, that we're doing um, in partnership with the agencies, which includes um, the FASD network, File Hills Capel Tribal Council, but the staff inside the agency. So it's not just the researcher evaluator, Michelle Stewart, talking to the executive directors, but rather we have all the team involved so that when we're thinking about evaluation, we're thinking about its um, broadest application. So we're thinking as broadly as possible about what we think works and don't work so that we can be constantly revisiting that in the hopes of making the strongest possible project um, throughout the course of the three years and beyond. So I'll open it up here. Um, maybe I'll turn it over to Lori um, to offer some insight here. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I guess for me, um, that term researcher makes me uncomfortable because I've never been one to, you know, want to uh, have outcomes of research that is published in some highfalutin journal that only a few people can uh, read and that um, while valued by the university is not not valued by me personally. I want to do work that um, can make a difference and makes a difference to, uh, to it just makes a difference. Um, so I think the output of community research like this is very much valued by me. I want to make uh, research projects make a difference for the people who, um, for the people where I live. Um, I think one of the big benefits for me is Anne. Um, Anne knows everybody and has connections everywhere. So as we have been moving to do the research, she knows who to talk to and she knows how to um, get us in, um, I guess, uh, at various venues where we can conduct the research. So that's been of real value. Great, thanks, Lori. Uh, Claire? I mean, I think I would probably just reiterate what Jack has already said. I think that, um, I mean, I, I will be completely honest that I don't know how much actually I offer or have brought to Jack because they are, they are exceptional. Um, and so what's been really meaningful for me is this is, this is essential work. Like to me, this is why I, you know, got interested in um, wanting to be an academic. Like all of these really passionate and exciting questions about social change you want to see happen. Well, like, Jack is making those things happen. Like the UR Pride is making these things happen. So finding a way to actually be grounded and um, contribute to work that to me is, is really essential. And really about the piece that Jack talked about around ethics, right? Like making sure that you are accountable to the people that you're actually hoping to support. Um, so being able to participate and learn um, amongst the conversations that we have and like thinking about best ways to, you know, do surveys, ask questions, have people be involved in research and how do we do that with some kind of care. Um, and awareness about the ways that we're differently positioned and the way that we're um, coming at these issues and, and questions. Um, so for me, this has just been hugely beneficial and I think essential to the work that I hope to do and, and basically, yeah, endeavoring to try to support the work that your Pride is doing. Thanks, Claire. And um, we had a, a moment before the full forum opened up today mm -hmm. to talk with the panelists and I was asking each of the different projects um, where students are embedded, um, you know, to get a sense of the type of training that might be taking place. And so Jack, for example, was saying that um, that they have, uh, you know, there are some students that are involved in the project. Jack um, is the executive director, not only of UR Pride, but is also a student. And the thing I think we're trying to think about here, um, and something that the Community Engagement Research Center does a lot of focus on is 
Um, can we find a, a really awesome way in which an agency can work with a faculty member at the U of R in a way that works for both of them, and then potentially um, that there can be some training for students. Um, and one of the reasons that I think we do that, or at least when I was the director of the CRU, one of the things I was quite invested in is trying to figure out what it looks like for succession planning, for getting students to sort of see the ways in which the work that they're understanding in the classroom does have an application in the so-called real world, but that also that classroom training gets undone um, when we start to actually look at the complexities of some of the social justice issues that agencies are taking on. Um, unconscious bias, we can call it that. We can talk about all the different isms that we might be sort of carrying around with us and not necessarily knowing until we're directly confronted. And that's for a student, for an evaluator, a researcher, an agency, a frontline staff. But that ability to put together an interesting combination of evaluators, researchers, individuals that are managing organizations and individuals delivering frontline services is really important and it is quite a chemistry. Um, and I think in an ideal world, we see the types of relationships, the generosity that we see in this kind of combination of individuals, right? Jack and Claire saying that they both learn from one another, Anne and, and Lori similarly, right? And then Tracy has done. Andrea and I have had a relationship now for many years. I think Andrea has been at the network for six years. I've had a relationship with that organization for that long, if not longer. You know that the relationships are really important and one of the things that really is lovely is when we can do some mentoring inside of that space in part for succession planning that we want to be training up another generation of awesome workers another generation of, of students that might become workers or could become evaluators they might work in policy later but that they really understand the complexity of the issue from these experiences where they just get a, a sense of these really longer standing relationships between agencies and the university but I think the other thing that projects like this allow us to do is to push back when we think that there isn't research in that area or we're not really satisfied with what we read when we try to demonstrate the evidence. And I can say that in the project that Andrea and I are working on, some of the things that I'm trying to do is to push back on the evidence as articulated, not only in the research, but as is taken up in the court, right? And so we're really looking at a, at a a restructuring of how frontline services are delivered to individuals. Um, in our case, we're not focusing on hiring justice workers. We're focused on hiring people that really understand the complexity of the issue, either from lived experience or from their own professional background that isn't necessarily in the justice field. We add that combination of, of education later because we're really focused on the worker um, that really is delivering these complex um, set of supports um, and hopefully feels like they're supported so that they can sustain themselves in that work. And so sometimes when we have these um, sort of interesting partnerships, it allows us to push on what the research tells us because sometimes the research is itself a problem. Um, and that's that's a big challenge in the field. Uh, yeah, Lori, go ahead and then I'll switch yeah. to another question. No, I just had something to add. You know, you talked about the value for students and mentoring students, but it's not just students. It's also the agencies and members of the agencies. Um, uh, because we're teach we're we're working with them too, so that they understand um, how they can make a difference with a voice that is um, founded in research. So it's not just students; it's everybody around um, that is being mentored in research. Great, thanks, Lori. Yeah, and, and one of the things that, that we've focused on in the partnership that um, Andrea and I have is to try to figure out how we do uh, co-design um, that is as inclusive as possible. Like I said, not just a one-to-one -one relationship of researcher evaluator to executive director, but really bringing everyone to the table um, in a way that we try to make as egalitarian as possible. But of course, I'm always working within the structures and the logic of the organizations that I partner with. Um, I know that there's some questions coming up. I think we're going to hold questions for just a moment here and then we're going to dive in again. Um, so I'm just going to throw out one more roundtable question before we open it up into some questions from the audience. Um, so this question here, what are some of the lessons learned or bumps in the road um, when we're talking about this type of collaboration? So this is that, that moment. I was like, well, it's really great, except sometimes when it's not. Um, so I think, again, I'm going to open it up to the agencies first. Um, you know, collaborating uh, with a campus partner can be great, um, but there are constraints. And so, um, you know, this is a sort of a broad question. I think it's always important that we can be open to thinking critically about these collaborations as well. So what are some of the lessons learned or bumps in the road, um, you know, experienced uh, when doing these types of collaborations? 
maybe this time here I'll start with Tracy. Sure, um, I'll just highlight one of the challenges that I've kind of uh, faced um, with the many kind of community or partnerships we've done and one is around timelines. Um, sometimes the timelines don't always um, line up or you have to wait for information to be published before you can use it, which doesn't always align. Awesome, um, maybe I'll go to Jack next. Yeah, um, I think for us, definitely one of the things that I've learned, and I think Lynn and Michelle could like understand this, uh, the timeline that we proposed to the Community Engagement Research Center was like is significantly different. Like we were supposed to be finished our project already, and it is just not. And I think part of that was like COVID and all these like complicated pieces. But I think one of the big pieces about it was that as a nonprofit provider, um, like research isn't the thing that's always in my mind. I'm thinking about like the people I serve and like the, the crisis that they're in and those types of things. And so um, I think one of the lessons that I've learned is really, um, and especially for me as an executive director, like I'm not doing the programming on a day-to-day -day basis. I have staff who do that. So um, I sort of took this on as, as like one of the projects that I would be working on and it Ten, and I think that it kept getting sort of the back the back seat of like there's other things like there's fires I need to put out um, and so one of the lessons learned for me is definitely ensuring that um, I think in the future having um, like sort of really working it and I almost sort of to, to Anne's point about like making sure that it's in the strategic plan it's like a part if research is something as a nonprofit, you know, I'm sort of speaking to other nonprofits in the room, if that's a thing that you want to be doing, making sure that that is actually included in your day to day and that that is like a focus of some of the work that you're doing, whether it's just for a year or two, or if it's like going to continue on into into your work moving forward, I think, um, I think uh, making sure that it's like a project that you have the time to commit to and, and those types of things can sometimes um, you know, I, I think as a student, like I know that, like I've had to do research as a student. And so like, I know how much work it is. I don't know why I thought in my head that like, oh, this is like something that I can just like have on the corner of my desk and like <laughs> come back to. Um, and so that's definitely, I think one of the, one of the lessons that I've learned for sure. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Jack. Um, Anne? Thanks everyone. Uh, so yes, nice, certain. Uh, What's nice. up? Be nice. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're we're nice. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the uh, the bumps in the road and the lessons learned. Um, I'm I'm very pleased to say that we had many many bumps in the road, and we had many many lessons learned. Um, and I think that that was really great because. Um, it certainly gave all of us involved uh, challenges that we did not expect when we engaged in this process. Um, it also allowed for a greater degree of um, growth as a, as a team and as individuals within that team. Um, and, you know, I guess the, the biggest thing uh, for me is that um, at the end of the day, and I'm sure there was a few times that Lori left uh, with a bit of a headache um, because, you know, we were quite insistent on, no, we're not asking the individuals that question. No, that, no, we're not asking that one. No, we got to find a different way to ask it. No, the, the, the language, the, the reading level is way too high for the participants that you're going to be interviewing. So we need to back that up. So there was a lot of back and forth, but um, honestly, I think that what, at the end of the day, what resulted, um, it's not only that relationship that was built, but the authenticity in the relationship and that, that really good solid foundation that moving forward, you know, if there's an expansion on this research, um, we did the important work of negotiating the relationship and prioritizing together as a group. Um, so we're in really good shape moving forward. Was that, was that nice enough, Lori? Yes, that was very nice. Actually, it, it wasn't a headache. I needed alcohol, but... <laughs> Can I, Michelle, can I just dovetail on that? Because it's kind of- I just throw it to Andrea first, then I'll throw it over to researchers. Just one sec, okay? 
Andrea, um, some challenges that you faced working with me. I can imagine there's a list. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not too much. It, it's, it's mostly good, Michelle, of course. Um, getting the contracts and stuff in order, I, I think sometimes the timelines, like we said, around that are can be tricky. Um, one thing that was new for me to navigate was a project that didn't uh, solely belong to the FASD network. So um, belonging to the university and being part of that project was something that was very different for me. So I think there's a lot of learning involved there, but the important part of that is that I think uh, Michelle and I have really good communication. And I think out of that, um, we can collaborate really well and um, it helps with the growth and the strength of the project itself when there is that communication. So I think there are going to be bumps in the road when it when it's a new thing and you're trying to do things a little bit differently. Um, but I think if you can work together um, with with the team, that's it'll definitely come out strong. And um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Great, thanks, Andrea. Lori, go ahead. I just wanted to dovetail onto what Anne said because um, the situation she described uh, with the questions and the language and the literacy, um, some of that was me navigating the academic structures that shape research, like the ethics board, and uh, and and the community. And I found myself. Um, very angry at the colonial structures of the university um, quite often and um, the request from the research ethics boards. I think this is a new um, paradigm of doing research and I'm not sure how prepared and I'm the former chair of the University of Regina Ethics Board just for everybody to know. Um, I'm not sure how much all ethics committee members are up to date on this approach. And so, for example, COVID, um, when COVID came down and we were asked as researchers, you know, what are you going to do with your project now that COVID's in place? My response was, I don't know, I have to talk to Anne and everybody else. I can't decide that on my own because this is a group project. So, so that's one a big barrier um, bump in the road hurdle uh, and that's just one example over uh, literacy levels another was um, over they wanted us to administer the survey interview thing in a in a private confidential space well it was through Anne and many meetings that we had where we talked about stuff like that, that I had to go back to the ethics board and say, no, the, the group ha says that this is not appropriate to do it the way you ethics board want it. So I think that's a big hurdle and, and an opportunity for ethics boards to um, shift how they think and change how they think. And now that this new approach, well, it's not so new, but many people call it a new approach to research is emerging. Great, thanks, Lori. Um, Claire, anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add something and I, it kind of connects the two questions, to be honest, um, in terms of something that is beneficial, but also I can imagine <laughs> for Jack and you are probably just about like lessons learned, navigating, right, academic institutions. And obviously they're in a particular position being kind of based um, on campus, but also as a community organization but realizing um, the lack of knowledge base in many ways across the university about 2S LGBTQ IAP plus uh, people, and that being a real barrier to doing a lot of the work and even getting that baseline of understanding for why this work is so necessary. Um, and what has basically happened is I've tried to support Jack in doing this, um, but now UR Pride is actually providing a lot of that core training across campus, right? So this has been hugely beneficial for the university and for, um, campus a huge advantage in terms of providing that kind of baseline um, that I can imagine right like that then takes more time away from the focus of actually getting the research done and having time to do that work because it's just produced another roadblock in some ways um, and just as a sort of small aside um, I think many people have already spoken to this but in another project I'm working with two other community organizations 
navigating ethics, navigating um, you know, funding applications, even though a lot of, of course, um, agencies do their own funding applications, the specifics and the frustrations, for lack of a better word, for some of the academic funding bodies, right? And trying to do that work and navigate and support them in that. Um, it's a completely different framework. So kind of sharing what Laurie's saying, right? Like the frustration that we also experience as academics navigating those systems and then trying to provide support um, for people that we're working to collaborate with <laughs> and also having to navigate that. But yeah, I'll just we'll throw that in. Great, thanks, Claire. I think that, um, you know, I think it's always important to look at the, there's the lovely parts of a project and then there's the more challenging parts of the project. Um, you know, and, and I think being able to actually have conversations about where the challenges are can be difficult. So the, the fact that each of the projects that we're talking about today um, are based on some, uh, some strong relationships does mean that there can be a critical conversation um, and critical engagement when there are um, issues. I think one that comes off comes up regularly um, in um, whoops uh, in community-based uh, research, um, participatory action research, community-driven research. Um, we're going to talk about a lot about these types of languages in the series forthcoming. Um, is the question around timelines, uh, as Jack and others have also spoken to this morning. Agencies uh, that are on this call know that often you're trying to find the money that supports the programming that you know you need to deliver. And then concurrently, sometimes you're trying to figure out what's the evidence or are we going to do a research project and get the evidence that talks about the need for this project. And that speaks towards sustainability, um, you know, in trying to have more than a one or a three year uh, pilot project and then the money goes away and, the, and those workers lines go away in your budget. So those timelines can be quite challenging for the researchers, something I think that you know, Lynn could speak about later if we have time as well. At the CRU um, or the Community Engagement Research Center, we've had to manage expectations when we bring faculty members in for them to understand that, yes, you're doing a research project and there might be an opportunity for publication, but it's not really the focus of this type of work. Um, and it's not to say that it's, it's impossible to publish on this type of work because you can, um, but I think that um, you know, this type of really close community engagement um, allows for the strengths of the researcher and the agency and the workers to come together. And the priority isn't, as Loria pointed out, these really rigid structures that exist within academia. You know, the motto is often used as publish or perish, um, which means that we have to justify who we are to the university to continue to keep our jobs um, by demonstrating that we can teach, um, that we can publish, and that we do some service. But I think for those of us that do community-based research um, or advocacy, um, we invert that a little bit and our service is much, uh, much the priority um, versus sometimes the research output and the research output are long timelines. Um, it's about writing articles. Andrea and I have an article that's going into press, um, you know, in the next couple of uh, months here, but the, it's like the fifth iteration of this article over many years, you know, and, and again, so for me, that's not a huge priority. Um, but for earlier career academics, that can be a really big challenge. It was a big challenge for me at the U of R at different times. Um, so that question around priority and, and what we invest our time in as academics is also challenging. Um, but I think Jack's point is a good one around the strat planning and also Anne spoke about this. You know, if we're embedding strat planning um, to think about evaluation and, and to think about research, then it allows there to be that, okay, we do want that to be a priority in what we're doing in a, as an agency. So how do we bring evaluation in? How do we bring research in in a way that does feel like it does fit um, to the mandates of our group? But these are all competing interests, um, you know, as an executive director, what you're expected to manage, as a researcher, what you're expected to manage. And then, of course, when all of it hits the ground, what does it really look like in practice? And some folks have alluded to it, um, but of course, we are doing this session um, on Zoom, uh, you know, in part because of the era we're in right now, which is, you know, COVID and everything did change. Um, projects did have to change. Um, but projects always have to adapt to the constraints of what it looks like to deliver the program um, from the original design idea to actually applying it and making sure that to the best of our ability, um, priorities are being met and that the line of communication is quite open. I can say an Andrea and I's project um, evaluation because it is co-designed and I'm very invested in the co-design, um, that that is the thing that has stalled, you know, but not in a way that's critical to the project. We know that the evaluation will roll out. We can count um, we can do the quantitative piece. What I want to do is a really robust qualitative piece to understand how the project works. And I think mixed methods are critical when we're doing evaluation. Okay, we're going to switch gears right now. 
prepare. Um, what I'd like is uh, I'm going to get all of the panelists to unmute um, so that you're able to just jump in. What I would like is for the panelists um, to just do a rapid fire sort of brainstorm right now, uh, just for a couple of minutes. Um, and then we're going to take a brain break for everybody for about five minutes and we're going to come back in and jump into audience questions. But rapid fire ideas that come off of your, off the top of your head, give me some words to describe a strong partnership or collaboration. So what are the things you're looking for? What's some words or phrases um, that come to mind? Honesty. Openness. Hey. Equalitarian. Mm -hmm. Non-hierarchical. Mm -hmm. Communication. Fun. Beneficial. Family centered. What centered? Family centered or individually or individualized. Okay. And community centered. Yeah. Keep going. I'm still so ready. Building. Mm -hmm. Symbiotic. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anti-oppressive. A few more? What's that? Decolonized. Colonized. Mm-hmm. Purposeful. Mm -hmm. uh, I think genuine. Cool. Meaningful. Great. Focused. Creative. I'd say loving. Mm -hmm. Couple more. Authentic. Nice. Unconditional. Transparent. Nice. I think All accountability right. as researchers. Accountability. Good. All right. My page is full. Okay. Um, so we are going to, oh, last one, Jack. Uh, I was going to say willingness to accept and give feedback. Mine stalled. One more oh, time. Sorry, willingness to give and accept feedback. Michelle's frozen for me now. I don't know if she's frozen for anybody else. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. You have powers, Jack. <laughs> Throws Michelle. Uh, who would have thought that that was possible? <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, well, I have no idea what she wants. I think, I don't know. I don't know. What if anyone's that. capable of it, it's you, Jack. <laughs> uh, I don't know what, uh, I don't know what she was hoping to do next. I think she, I think we were supposed to take a Right. Yeah, I, I can jump in here. Um, I'll just take over for Michelle. It looks like she's jumped off and maybe we'll come back on. But we were going to take a five minute break. So what I'll ask or invite everyone to do is just um, please mute and turn off your camera for a little bit to give yourselves a break. And we'll come back shortly for uh, our question period. Thanks.
All right, folks, I think we're going to get started again. It's 1125. Good. I was going to see if some folks can unmute their screen, make sure people can see me. Sorry, I disappeared into Zoom land. Hasn't happened in a long time. I was like, oh, Jack stalled. No, I'm not on a Zoom call anymore. Hmm. So um, I think we're all experiencing this as more people come onto the networks we're using. <laughs> So um, thanks uh, for the end of that conversation. And the reason I wanted us to sort of do that brainstorm is uh, twofold. Some of these uh, questions when we're thinking like honesty, openness, you know, non-hierarchical, fun, focused, creative, um, you know, and the list goes on and on. Some of these are, are the types of words we should really be thinking about when we start to forge those relationships. Um, do, do I want to work with Andrea for the next three years and probably in perpetuity after that, right, as we continue to morph out these projects? Like, yeah, because there's certain values that I put into the relationship that I have with Andrea. And then some of that language actually does go into the, to the grant applications and some of the language doesn't, you know. And as this series um, kind of evolves, there's going to be an opportunity to really talk about the brass tacks of putting together grant applications and evaluation protocols. And so just to take a quick step back, um, you know, I want to recognize that the reason that this series is happening um, and this talk is happening today, um, you know, the, the question of um, impact through collaboration, this is part of a sort of a monthly um, panel discussion that we're going to have that's going to be looking at different parts of community based research and evaluation that will lead up to some funding that is available through the city of Regina, um, I believe in February. Um, you know, so we're fortunate that just as folks have talked um, throughout the morning, the important work that Lynn does on the campus, um, you know, the person that really brought a lot of us into conversation around this series is uh, Emily Grafton. Um, so Emily reached out, um, you know, to Lynn, um, who's the community director of the Community Engagement uh, Research Center. Um, Emily also asked me in my role as the institutional lead for community-based research to sort of join in a conversation um, with Kelly Husak, who's with us today, and uh, David Slater, to talk about a way in which we might be able to facilitate some conversations and further open up our understandings of these collaborations between the university and between our community partners to further help um, the nonprofit agencies that are putting in funding applications to get that additional support if that's helpful, or to have these kind of conversations to talk about some of the challenges in doing collaborations between researchers, evaluators, and the frontline agencies that provide direct support and services in our community. So um, thanks to all the folks that helped make this session um, you know, uh, come together, um, which included, like I said, Emily, Kelly, Lynn, and David, as well as our panelists to sort of share their insight. So we're gonna open it up um, and have some questions here um, from the audience. I believe Kelly has been collecting some questions um, because as soon as I got kicked off, I can't see the questions anymore. Um, but I know there was some good ones there, including <laughs> one from Alcidere I'd like to return to after. But um, Kelly, what are, what's, what's the first question we can throw out to our panelists? So the first one, we'll get back to the one from Alistair there in a second, but uh, the one question I just wanted to touch base on because it follows up on some of the early introductions, it's posed to Andrea in particular, um, and looking at the relationship that they have with the Foul Hill Capellas Tribal Council, um, if she could speak a little bit more to what that relationship looks like, um, just as a follow up. Sure. Um, so Fall Hills Capel falls under that same uh, subcontract through the University of Regina that the FASD network does. And we work alongside them uh, with the res their restorative justice program. So we collaborate on some case, case management. We share some of the peer navigators who are mostly based in Regina. And, uh, you know, we talk to them a lot about um, we, we do a lot of professional development with them as well and with with our staff so it really is um, a team when we're doing the collaboration around the professional development and the case planning and, and the program evaluation. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, the second question that we have here is going to be posed um, to both the agencies as well as the researchers that we have on the call because I know each of you will have had your own experience with how you've gone about finding funding um, to take part in this work. Um, and so it's a bit of a what has been posed as a chicken and egg question. So if an organization wants to engage in research or evaluation, is research funding needed first? 
Um, so that, if so, is there a typical time horizon to pursue or acquire research funding? So if that is something that you've found in your experience, um, we, you can chat about that. And if not, you can speak to your experience about how you've acquired funding or how those relationships are formed and then that transitioned into the project itself. And so I don't know, Michelle, would you like to pose that in your order that you would like? Um, so I think the, the chicken and egg kind of question, um, I think maybe we'll throw it to our agencies first because it does seem to be posed as a question um, you know, for agencies. If you need research done, uh, do you get the money first or do you do the research first? How do you do the research if you don't have the money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, iterations and iterations, right? So the, the phenomena. Um, maybe I'll throw it out first this time to uh, maybe to Tracy and then we'll just kind of open it up. Oh, maybe Tracy stepped away. Um, Jack, I think I saw that you were unmuting. Do you want to go ahead and jump in? Yeah, totally. So Alistair, I mean, I can talk, all I can really talk a little bit about is sort of our journey into starting to do research. And for us, um, it really just started as we were often approached to be like community-based um, partners for researchers. So researchers would reach out to us and say, hey, I need some help with recruitment or I need some help in this way or this way. And, and often in those, as those relationships naturally develop, there can sort of be some like, you know, hey, this is actually a question that, you know, that's relevant to your research that we would really like answered. I'd love to, to support the, the work that you're doing um, as, as an academic or as a researcher, but can you try to answer this question for us? And so that um, I think is, is sort of um, the, the beginning ways that we started building those relationships. And then um, for us, we really got into research because um, we had a practicum student approach us who wanted to work with us, who said, for a practicum project, I wanna work on this research. Um, and it, we had never taken on a research project before. And so, um, and unfortunately, because of the, the rules with the University of Virginia social work program, it's against the policies to, to pay that student. So as much as I hate asking for uh, or, or expecting unpaid labor, um, that sort of person was, a lot, was able to work pretty extensively on a project without being paid. Um, not that I'm like, <laughs> like exploit the, the, the like, the like labor of your of students. Um, but I think for us, that's how we got into this work at first. And so we were able to, um, through sort of supervising that project, but also connecting with faculty members, like Claire helped a little bit with, with supervising that project um, through with a student, we were able to sort of develop like um, uh, some level of like, I don't want to say expertise because it's really not expertise, but um, like we had been able to show some capacity for like we've done research before or we've engaged in research projects before so that when we did start applying for smaller pots of funding, you know, like a thousand dollars here, five hundred dollars there, we were able to sort of show some level of like we're we're aware of what research involves and what it what it takes. Um, so we definitely didn't start with funding. Um, but one of the other pieces that I might suggest to you, uh, if you sort of get approached a lot by organizations to or by um, by researchers to promote or recruit for you, um, is um, we've started uh, inviting people to make a donation in exchange for recruit for helping recruit or whatever. Um, and some some people can't, some people can't, but we're able to sort of put that money aside for future projects that we might be interested in doing as people make donations for our work or our consultation or support on their on their research projects. So um, yeah, those are some 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 strategies that I'd that I'd encourage you to look at. Great, thanks, Jack. I'll open it up to the other agencies on the call and then I'll open it up to the researcher evaluators. Um, I, I would say it is a lot about um, communication and um, relationship. So because Michelle and I have, have worked together for a number of years, there's, there's projects she knows that are FASD related or, you know, um, a colleague of hers might say, um, I have this really neat thing. I know we did uh, we did an improv project together for for people with FASD, which is something that probably I wouldn't have come up with on my own. But um, just through that connection to to Michelle connecting us to to other researchers, um, we got we were 
that happened. And we do have some connection then to um, the University of Saskatchewan as well, just mm -hmm. um, because people want to know about FASD. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Andrea. Um, Anne or Tracy? Yeah, for us, um, one of the things we did was we had kind of the idea of what information we needed and what gap of information we had. And then we just emailed Lynn. Um, so sometimes it's just a cold email saying we have an idea um, and then she's helped us um, find some funding. Um, other times we have had some funding and we needed some help to do it. Um, but I think Lynn was always the, um, or and her predecessors um, through Community Engagement and Research Center. Um, I think sometimes just that cold email um, can get things started. Great, thanks. Uh, Anne? Certainly for us, the conversation came first um, around, you know, what is, is, how important is this to everyone? And then the funding came after, and of course it was Lynn. Um, and one thing that I wanted to just share um, for community-based organizations that are in direct service every day, and, you know, again, you're under-resourced, you're, uh, you've got a lot of uh, balls that you're juggling in the air. Um, the idea of, of engaging in research with the U of R um, can be very intimidating, um, you know, because of course you're now in, in a whole different realm around the, the ethics around research and all of those things. So I think that that for a lot of organizations uh, prevents them from engaging. So um, it's really important. And for us, it was very important that the relationship was built up first and the conversation occurred uh, before we went in for the funding. And, and so, you know, and Lynn's a great resource in the community. Um, and certainly been very helpful to us. So that would be the only, my only comment about that. Great. I'll open it up in just a second to Claire and Lori as well. I think when I hear that question, um, the chicken and egg phenomena, the other thing it makes me think of is, um, and one of the things that I'm quite invested as, uh, as an applied researcher is to try to demystify the research process as much as possible through collaboration. Um, and so from my perspective, when I hear that question, I'm also hearing questions I've heard posed to me in other projects before, which is people saying, if I'm supposed to put together an evidence-based research proposal for this money, I don't understand how I'm going to find the evidence. I don't know what the evidence is because from their perspective, the evidence is that anecdotal material that, that Jack spoke about earlier. They're saying, this does exist. I can see it every day. Um, and so what I often say is, okay, to collaborate then to try to create a question that sort of um, helps organize your research project or the inquiry you want to make, we need to understand what other people have talked about. And so this goes to that chicken and egg question that was posed. Um, how do you get the money to do the research or how do you understand what's already been done in the research? And so there are other opportunities, I think, that can be um, shorter term at the U of R. Some of those can be potentially through, again, contacting Lynn. Um, not that we want everybody to pick up the phone and call in as soon as they get off of this phone call, but the Lynn, that Lynn does also have access um, to uh, a group of students um, through an arts internship, which is different than other practicum placements, where you could have a group of students that could be mentored to do a really small literature review, um, working with a faculty member to try to find some of that baseline information that uh, executive director and frontline worker know as fact, but we can go find the evidence that also supports that lived experience understanding. Um, and of course, there's also the funding that's available through um, the CRU or CERC, or as Jack is telling everyone, there's also funding available through Regina Public Interest Research Group on campus. And these are all small amounts of money, but they're just enough money sometimes to get that little bit of research done that informs um, the project that you're about to do that is cross-informed from the things that you see in the work that you do on a daily basis. So there can be multiple levels. And so it's maybe that the chicken and the egg are constantly in a, in a in a dead heat in their in their race. Um, Laurie or Claire, anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, this this type of funding and research is allow, allowing me, hopefully, to crack a rotten egg out there. Um, that in the research realm, um, there's a shirk strategic knowledge clusters, and there's one on homelessness. It's called the Canadian Observatory on homelessness and it's a research network of people who do research on homelessness. Um, one of the challenges I find with that group is that most of the 
information that is generated from that group um, are in large centers, Toronto, Calgary, um, big places where, um, which we're different. Um, we're different here for a variety of reasons um, because of the large indigenous population that we have, because of the geography of the province that it's so spread out that many rural communities don't have resources. Um, and as somebody from Toronto, uh, originally I never really realized how well resourced Toronto was until I came to Regina. Um, so I, I'm hoping that by doing this research too, with, um, through the community research unit, that I'll be able to go for larger grants in time. I'll be able to clearly articulate that we're different here in Saskatchewan. And um, so hopefully we can uh, really do a lot of work in the future that is specific to our context here in Saskatchewan. Thanks, Laurie. Claire? I, mean, I think I would just reiterate part of what Andrea already said and, and Jack, really what's fundamental at the core of this is, is building those relationships, right? And so kind of meeting the chicken and the egg. So finding out about like, what is the information that is needed? How you, can you go and do some kind of um, baseline support to enable, for example, in my case, you are proud to do that work. Um, so yeah, to me, it's, it's really about that being grounded in those relationships. Yeah, and I found sort of as I've built relationships as a nonprofit with different faculty members, when there is like a grant opportunity that they're excited about as academics, they'll reach out to me and say, hey, is there a thing that you are wanting research that I can help with? Um, and, you know, the, the more relationships that you're able to build with researchers, the more likely it is that they're going to connect with you um, when those opportunities come up. Yeah, I think Andrea has learned to, to ignore whenever I send a text saying, hey, do you got a second quick question? It's usually like, I found some money. Do you want to try to spend it with me? <laughs> um, but again, uh, you know, we're depending on the networks that the academics um, are in, they're seeing a number of different funding streams come across um, their desk. And some of those are, um, they're called tri-council um, or tri-agency. And that's like the, the, you know, the social sciences, the natural sciences and uh, health institutes all have certain funding streams. Um, Saskatchewan has a cluster of funding streams. Um, there's a number of different funding streams that operate at the U of R at the smaller sort of micro grant level. And Jack and myself have been putting um, links in on the thread here um, for links to the Community Engagement Research Center to Regina Public Interest Research Group. Um, you know, Kelly and folks from the city of Regina, maybe at the very end, can talk about the funding that's available, um, you know, in February. So there's a lot of opportunities for little bits of money. We also know that there's been quite a lot of money thrown at COVID. Um, so there's been a lot of collaborative opportunities um, with COVID. Of course, um, for any of us that have been trying to work from our home or pull offices out of, um, you know, out of our main offices, that response from COVID is largely to try to backfill um, crises, less uh, opportunity for research. Um, so I wanted to switch gears though. We'll go back to another set of questions from the audience in a moment, but I wanted to switch gears from the research piece to directly to the evaluation piece. And so I'll probably just open this up broadly to everyone, um, but how do you engage in evaluation and how does that relate to the broader aims of your project? Um, that could be in the area of reporting or succession planning, but how do you engage in the evaluation piece? And I asked that specifically um, as an applied researcher and a number of years ago, um, a national team that I was working with, um, you know, this was a critical conversation that would happen when we would have our team meetings is uh, people would ask like, what's the evaluation you're doing for your applied projects? Um, you know, this is quite a while back now for me, but it, it, it made me switch gears because I was going from being um, a traditionally trained researcher when I came to the University of Regina for the last 10 years, I've been an applied researcher. So I'm often trying to do the work like I'm doing right now with Andrea. Um, but what does it mean to actually do evaluation that we're invested in? Um, and what does that mean? So we have to often do evaluation for reporting, um, but there's a lot of different elements to evaluation. So I thought I would just open it up to the team um, here, the panelists. How do you take on the question of evaluation? I, I would like to jump in on this one. Um, take it away, just, 
and just share a little story. So um, back in two, probably 2005, uh, so what, 15 years ago, um, as an organization, we, as part of our strategic planning process, um, one of the things that we wanted to engage in was a broad-based evaluation where um, we had former participants and former staff and current staff and, and volunteers that we worked with as well as uh, funders and supporters of the organization and just people out in the community. And the, one of the one of our partners in the community, um, you know, we we didn't do a very good job of letting people know what we were doing. Like we knew what we were doing, but we didn't uh, communicate that very well. And so when the evaluators got in touch with um, the list of people that we said, you know, here's some here's some uh, people that we think would probably give you some good information about our work. Um, one of them immediately called and said, is everything okay? Because I just got a call about an evaluation, <laughs> a broad-based community event, and there was that real negative sort of connotation to it. Um, I'm glad to say we've come a long way. So there's a greater understanding around evaluation that is not necessarily something that, you know, that organizations can engage in it. And um, it's really expected now um, that that organizations are doing that self-reflection and evaluation and taking our own inventory with reference to are we making a difference in the community? Is the work, are the efforts that we're putting forward, is there a community impact as a result of that? Um, and this is particularly true in um, as an Indigenous organization that is working with a large number of Indigenous people, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. You know, did we use the uh, the evaluation, um, the results of the evaluation? It related to the broader aims because it it pretty much set the stage for us for the next ten years of our work, and. Um, we have engaged in a lot of external evaluations. Um, we've, we've always done the internal e evaluations, but there's a great value in uh, finding the resources necessary um, to be able to evaluate a, a project. And we actually started building it into some of our proposals that the mm -hmm. costs of those evaluations was included as part of the, the ask. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks, Anne. That's wonderful. Um, I could go on and on and on about evaluation, so I won't bore people. Um, other folks from the panel? For our projects, um, thinking more than just the accessing healthy food, we've done a formal evaluation where we've actually evaluated the community and university um, partnership within Food Regina, um, where we hired an external evaluator to come in. Um, but at a minimum, I think if you sit down and have some conversations as you're going throughout it, how is this working? Um, are we getting what we need? Um, and then at the end of it, when we sit back and see our product, we've always had a conversation about, is this worth it? Would we do a, a university kind of partnership again? Um, and despite sometimes having a lot of challenges and an incredible amount of work that goes along with it, the answer is always yes, because you wouldn't have got the product um, if you didn't have that collaboration. Great, thanks, Tracy. Maybe one other folk, one other person can jump in here, and then we're going to grab one more or two more questions from the audience. Anyone else want to share some info on evaluation? Um, I've just said, and I know that Tracy just mentioned external evaluators, but I have found external evaluators so helpful. Um, and uh, I know, sort of, it, it can be hard to find funding for external evaluators, but. Um, if you're a nonprofit who seeks out, who accesses like federal funding, especially, um, there's usually an opportunity to apply for funds to pay for an external evaluator. And that can sort of be um, just like an expert in your community who's sort of really knowledgeable about something, but, or you can also seek out a researcher or an academic who's not on your project, <laughs> like don't, because that is not external, uh, but uh, sort of, uh, you know, maybe maybe someone at a university who's who's familiar with with certain types of, with whatever topic you're looking at. Um, but yeah, I found external evaluation really helpful. Yeah, and I think that external evaluation, um, building evaluation, and there's a number of different strategies, and we're going to have a whole session actually where where you discuss evaluation, so we can talk about the different perspectives on evaluation. Um, 
you know, I'm a participatory researcher. Um, and so I build that into evaluation and I'm happy to have conversations with people about that, like what co-design can look like, um, the importance of co-design, um, but then some of the challenges you have, right? Because everyone's embedded inside of the evaluation framework. Um, how do you sort of balance out all of those different interests? Because ultimately, I think what we are trying to get at is, going back to Anne's comment, um, moving away from the negative connotation around evaluation. I think we are slowly moving away because evaluation is embedded and it's, it's expected in most um, grant applications, especially at the federal level, um, that those outcomes are identified and that you can evaluate um, the progress of the project, um, but that we're not necessarily thinking that evaluation always means that someone's gonna come in and say it did or it didn't work because that's not really evaluation, right? There's, there's something much more robust that can happen. And I think actually something that can really lend itself to that further collaboration and willingness to have open and transparent conversations. Um, so that the needs of everyone is being met, but ultimately at the end of the day, we are figuring out if the project that is on the ground um, is doing what we expected it to do, how is it doing what we expected it to do, and really critically important, um, is our time best used with this project and is any harm being produced? Because I think sometimes that is where there are some blinders um, and there's an inability to see when we get tunnel vision that this is the thing we want to be doing with our project um, that we don't always recognize that there can be incidental harm because we're so invested in the potential benefit and there's been good work done on that regard as well. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Kelly. Uh, Kelly, do you have another question from the audience? Yes, one more question. Um, so a bit on a broader scale, so how has research collaborations um, that uh, groups have experienced here impacted nonprofit staff or boards, if any. Okay, I'll open that up to the agencies then. Um, I guess I would say impact. Um, well, I mean, it, it, I think that question's pretty broad, but um, impact for staff is allowing us, I guess, to do some more, uh, take a digger, bigger dive into the justice system and supporting people with FASD. And also looking at um, the big systemic um, reasons that people are involved in the justice system or there is over incarceration of um, indigenous people. So the staff, all together, we're, we're doing a lot of work around um, colonization and around white fragility and things like that, which we may not have had the opportunity um, to as a big group. So that's part of what I was talking about with um, FHQ and us and, the, and Michelle and part of her group as well. Doing that work together, I think, is, is really powerful. And... Um, yeah, an, an opportunity we probably wouldn't have otherwise to have that big of a group working on that, so. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, another, other perspectives? I can certainly jump in. Um, Thanks, Anne. So the impact on the, the nonprofit staff, so um, in, uh, in our organization, I can you know speak about um, this most recent project that we're working on. Um, because we have a large indigenous staff, um, we have many people with lived experience. And to be able to include them, when we were talking about the questions where, you know, and, and as you probably sensed from the conversation earlier on, um, th there was a little bit of back and forth reference to uh, the research questions that were posed and then our ability to negotiate and to have uh, someone with lived experience involved in that process to be able to say, no, they, no, they don't ask that question. That's, that, that's not a, that's a disrespectful, that, you know, you see that as a good question, but from this perspective, this is a disrespect. And so, you know, that, that um, inclusion, um, and this is the important thing that I think is, a, um, you know, certainly from our project, I can't speak to other ones, but the basis of reconciliation, everyone talks about the calls to action and, and you know, one of our elders once said, um, these are not calls to talking these are calls to action and he wasn't kidding <laughs> and so the very fact that we're researching hidden homelessness and we've got researchers from the U of R involved in the community they were actually right in 
uh, the midst of the community. You know, that's how we build that understanding. We start building that, those bridges um, around what is actually happening in the community. So it's that, that broader relationship building. Um, you know, we didn't start off to um, engage in an exercise of reconciliation, but that's how it ended up. And that applies to our boards as uh, to our board as well. Uh, they're very active in, um, you know, our own organization and what's happening in the community. And so, um, you know, it's great when we can help them because they're all volunteers, right? So it's great when we can help them build a greater understanding of the actual work that's being done. So that's all I wanted to add. Um, great, thanks, Dan. The only, the only thing that I would say, which I think I'm sort of going in a different direction in terms of just like logistical, logistically how it's impacted my board um, is my board and has ended up thinking that we have a lot more capacity than we have. And so, and I think a lot of my board members are students. And so they're sort of like, they're not, they don't have tons of board experience, but they'll often come to me and be like, hey, you're doing that other research product. You should also do this. Um, because they don't, there's not really an understanding of exactly what that means. So um, I would just say that, um, I think it depends if you have sort of a working board or a governance board, but my board is very much a governance board. And so I don't, they don't super know what the day-to-day -day looks like. Um, and I think that sometimes that can lead them to making assumptions about what type of work we can actually engage in. Um, yeah. So that's how I'd say it's impacted my board. Awesome. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> anybody else want to add anything to that impact to the boards or nonprofit staff? Um, I can speak. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, please. I was just going to say from my perspective, um, if it's your first time doing it, um, I think sometimes it can be a little bit of a roller coaster of emotions um, because you're learning, you're building a new relationship and a new partnership, but sometimes you've set some pretty tight timelines so you don't have that time to build that relationship and learn how each other works and learn the different languages because how one group might define a final report might be different than another group, how they refine a, define a final report and what it looks like. Um, so sometimes there's a lot more back and forth and um, but at the end of the day, I think it builds capacity on both parties. Um, and as long as you keep going back to those kind of shared goals and shared outcomes, it's a, it's a beneficial one. Great, Lori. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of value in the questions coming from the community so that the work that we do is what the community wants. And I hope for me, and might think differently, but I hope this leads to more of a long-term partnership beyond this individual project where in future we can work together on different things. Um, some of the elements that come out of this project, I know that kind of the central question that we always are asking the community is, so what's missing and what can we do to develop something to service you or fit your needs? And I'm, I'm hoping that once we get to the answer to that question and if we implement something that Anne and I and, and Lisa and Lynn can still work together on looking at, okay, now we've put this in place. Is this what you want? Is it helping you? So I'm hoping that it can lead to long-term valuable research that, and programs that will satisfy the needs of our community. Great, thanks, Lori. Um, so we're just going to start to um, sort of uh, wind down here. Um, and thanks uh, to all of our panelists today. So we'll do this. I'll do this this way or I'll give high fives. That's like, that's my mission usually. Um, so thanks for everyone who came out today um, and listened to the conversation. And just in this last 30 seconds here, I'm going to throw things over to Kelly. The link to the City of Regina um, page is up in the corner here. Um, this is uh, one of many series that are happening. October 26th is our next. So you can check out Eventbrite. Community Engage Research Center will also have information. Kelly, do you want to just give a quick blurb though for a pitch for the February funding? For sure. So we do have major and minor grants that are available annually for both new initiative as well as annual programming. Um, it's about a $2 million pot of funding, but a lot of that funding does go to supporting annual programs. 
Um, I'd encourage you, I did send the link in the chat so you can go forward there or you can just simply Google um, City of Regina Community Investments um, and you can find a lot more information. You can get in contact with myself or Dave Slater at any time. Um, we are in particular in our unit are responsible for the social development grants, but there are other grants such as um, cultural grants and so on and so forth. So. Um, there's lots to think about, lots to take in, and I'm sure there's lots of um, information that has been shared here today that will stimulate a lot of thought and discussion going forward. So thank you all. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and so we have in the corner here the links to the upcoming events. So the next one, October 26th, the do's and don'ts when applying for community grants. Um, there's going to be a session on evaluation, and it's going to go from there. So special thanks again to our panelists today. Also thanks to Emily Grafton, Kelly Husak, Lynn Jidlick, and David Slater for putting this series on. And hopefully it's, a, it's an entry point. Um, you know, if you're looking to try to partner and you have some questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm the Institutional Lead for Community-Based Research at the U of R. My name is Michelle Stewart. You can easily find me. Lynn, as you've seen, is also a great resource to connect uh, campus and community. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Kelly, um, for moderating with Lynn. Um, I think that's it for us. So have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.